Okay, so the 2012 Scholarship Physics paper, we're up to question 5, a physics compilation. A, the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of Mars is 3.71 metres per second squared. Mars has a radius of 3,395 kilometres. Its period of revolution is a little over 24 hours. Show that the satellite needs to be positioned that far from the centre of Mars so that it remains stationary with respect to an observer on the planet. Okay, so we're dealing here with a geostationary orbit about Mars. This is Mars, and we're just going to draw a diagram because we should have all of our information in an easy to uh, read and understand way. Um, some people are good at just absorbing it and getting a model in their head. I'm not that good, especially when I've been up um, dealing with sick kids and things like that. So a reliable method uh, of, yeah, getting all the information clearly as a diagram. We're trying to find this distance here, I'll call it the radius of the satellite, RS, uh, from um, the center of Mars. We've been given the radius of Mars, um, which I'll just call it RM. We're given the acceleration at the surface of Mars, AM, which is uh, 20, no, it's uh, 3.71 meters per second per second, or meters per second squared, um, and we, uh, let's see, we don't know the acceleration of the satellite, um, but we do know the time period for both is the same, little over 24 hours. I'll just put that like that, that we know it. Okay, so um, the question actually very nicely leads you uh, into the equations to use. Uh, by giving you this information, the acceleration at the surface is going to be the same as the centripetal acceleration. So we can come up with um, the acceleration at the surface of Mars, um, centripetal acceleration if you like, is also equal to, um, from Newton's gravitation formula, uh, universal gravitational constant, a constant times the mass of Mars, big M, small m, uh, subscript small m, it's not big M small m, we've removed the mass on both sides, so instead of having the force due to gravity, we're having the acceleration due to gravity, but it's also the centripetal acceleration of an object on the surface. Um, and divided by the radius of Mars. And w what we're heading for with this is, we're trying to find an unknown variable, we're pretty much going to have to come up with some sort of simultaneous equation solution. So that's one equation. Um, we can come up with a second equation, we can look at the uh, acceleration of the satellite, which remember we don't know this time, and uh, that's also going to be g times the mass of Mars, but this time it's over the radius of the satellite, and I've, I forgot the squared, you would have noticed that I'm sure. Um, and we can come up with a third equation, this time uh, for the acceleration of the satellite in terms of um, uh, the centripetal acceleration formula, um, AC equals V squared over R. Um, this is the velocity of the satellite, um, and I'm only going to deal with that velocity, so I won't do a subscript, and again it's over the radius of the satellite. We can expand this just a little bit further, because the velocity is going to be the distance over time. The distance is the circumference of the orbit, so it's going to be 2 pi times the radius of the satellite, and over the time period, T that we know, so all of that is the velocity squared, <coughs> excuse me, divided by the radius of the satellite. Okay, and uh, yeah, so we can, that'll become 4 pi squared rs over t, because the rs on the bottom will cancel out one of the squareds for the rs's. And pretty much what we do is simultaneously solve these, so I'll lead you through that uh, a little bit, just over here. Um, we will uh, combine equations 2 and 3, because they equal each other. And we'll have uh, g, mass of Mars, divided by rs squared, um, equals uh, 4 pi squared rs. Remember, the squared is cancelled out uh, over t squared, because the period is the same. Now, uh, we're trying to find rs, so we'll make rs the subject. That's going to be rs cubed. Uh, equals uh, g mass of Mars uh, t squared over 4 pi squared. Okay, now the only thing here that we are going to have trouble with, because we know the period t, we just have to convert it to seconds, we know 4 pi squared 
um, in T-squared. So the, the G, if we've not given it at the front of the, at the start of the information, we can actually get rid of it using equation 1 over here. Um, we can rearrange that so that G mass of Mars equals A uh, R squared. So we're just basically bringing this bit over to this side. And we, can, we know uh, the acceleration on the surface of Mars, we know the radius of Mars. Um, so we can substitute that for the G and the mass of the Mars bit. Um, so we'll end up with Rs cubed equals uh, acceleration on the surface of Mars times the radius of Mars, which is 9, times T squared over 4 pi squared. And then you can just work that through yourself to find the answer, which is 2.042 times 10 to the 7 meters. Um, yeah, there we go. That's that. Next question. Um, this is not as tricky as it seems, this one. We've got 12 identical 1 volt batteries connected in an electrical circuit. Um, what would be the reading of the voltmeter? Explain your answer. Um, perhaps the confusing bit is they don't give you these assumptions to start with. The assumptions are pretty important. Each battery has the same internal resistance and the voltmeter has infinite resistance. Okay, uh, and they're identical 1 volt batteries. So um, there's a couple of ways we can approach it. I'm just going to throw out a couple of ideas. So if we talk about conservation um, of energy, or in a slightly different form, we could talk about Kirchhoff's voltage law, which is also in its way conservation of energy. Um, in the loop, um, the voltage drop, the the uh, voltage drop across the internal resistance of each of these, has to be the EMF of the battery. Um, so uh, what what we're actually going to end up with here is the voltmeter reading is going to equal zero volts. Or well, the other thing to just be aware of is symmetry. Um, there's a lot of kind of symmetry arguments in, in these couple of questions here, but because the circuit's exactly the same all the way around, the voltage drop across each um, each resistor has to be exactly the same. And what that means is across each section of the battery, you've effectively got a uh, an EMF. And then you've got a internal resistance R, which has a voltage drop across it, of EMF. And then you go on to the next one. So if you're measuring the potential energy difference between two ends, it's going to be zero. Because every bit that's supplied is also lost across as heat across the resistor. Um, and I'll give you one other, going back to the conservation of energy idea. If there is not a complete loss, if it's not zero, then you would be gaining a little bit of energy each time. Um, you went across a cell, and then as you went around the circle, uh, over and over and over with your current flow, you'd be increasing energy somehow, and that can't happen. So there you go. I must admit I spent hours and hours pondering that one and thinking about different situations, but um, it's, a, it's a good one. C. The circuit below consists of eight resistors with resistance R. Explain why B and D are the same potential. So there's B, there's D. Um, you can talk about symmetry again. And um, you might like to mention current flow, um, because the paths are identical, which is your symmetry, the current flow uh, from A to B is the same as the current flow from A to D. If the current flow is the same and the resistors is the same, uh, that means the potential difference across each resistor is the same, which means the, the energy potential at D and at B has to be the same. Okay, I won't repeat that because it's, yeah, you can rewind. Calculate the effective resistance between A and C. So uh, this one might seem a little bit more tricky because you've got these funny resistors in the middle here. Um, but in reality, those resistors do absolutely nothing um, because if B and D are at the same potential, that means O also, and right in the center, has to be the same potential because there's one resistor going through to it. And in fact, there's two resistors on every pathway between A and C. Those resistors in the middle that I've circled and crossed out, they don't do anything because there is no um, potential difference or no voltage across uh, from D, that's D to O, and B to O. There's no potential difference, therefore there'll be no current flow, therefore those do not affect the resistance of the circuit. And then you're left with um, three lots of 2R in, uh, in parallel. So 1 over 2R plus 1 over 2R plus 1 over 2R is equal to 3 over 2R 
that's the inverse of the total resistance for the circuit. So your total resistance is going to be two thirds, uh, sorry, yeah, two thirds R, two thirds of any one of those resistors. Lovely. Last one. A force between a pair of charges given by Coulomb's law. Uh, I don't know if you've covered that these uh, this year or previous years, but there it is. Um, where K is a constant, Q1 and Q2 are the charges, R is the separation of the charges. Looks like the universal gravitation formula, and that's not a coincidence. Field theory had a lot of influence on um, how they formed these equations, and uh, they tend to work. Anyway, uh, until you get quantum... Ooh. No, it's fine. A charge uh, Q and another charge 4Q placed at the coordinates X equals 0 and X equals L. Let's draw this. So we've got Q and we've got 4Q and the distance of separation of those is L. Um, find where on the line between them the resultant electrostatic force on a third charge is 0. So let's draw that in. It's going to be closer to Q because it's a smaller charge so the effect of it will be smaller um, in comparison to 4Q. And um, I'm going to call this R because that's what the marking schedule uses and it's also tidier than using subscripts like L subscript 1, L subscript 2. And we're trying to find the position of that charge in between where it's not affected by um, the, the fields. So what that means is the force between uh, small Q, big Q has to be the same as the force between uh, 4Q, 4 small Q, big Q. So we're going to have a, another equation where we uh, write, um, here we go, the Coulomb's law um, for one side equals the Coulomb's law for the other side. Um, and we're going to, yeah, we'll just do that. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing because you can follow it through. But here we go, we end up with um, a constant small q big q over um, r equals constant. 4Q, big Q, over, and we're dealing with this gap here, so we'll just do that as L minus R, because that gives us, oh, I've forgotten the squared once again, oh, dangerous stuff, um, and uh, that's just going to deal with this in, in uh, variables that we want, rather than multiplying extra variables, I don't mean multiplying in a literal sense, metaphorical, anyway, uh, we can cancel a lot, we can cancel our Ks, we can cancel our Qs, we can cancel our big Qs. And we're left with uh, 1 over r squared equals 4 over l minus r squared. And you're going to rearrange that and you'll get to a quadratic equation, which will be l squared minus 2lr uh, minus 3r um, squared equals 0. Um, and then you'll factorize that l minus 3r times l plus r equals 0, which means, uh, back to your year 11 maths, I believe, L must equal 3R or R. And it obviously, from our diagram above, L cannot equal R because L is much longer than R. So it's not that. So L equals 3R. We can rearrange that to say that R, the distance of the charge away, which is what we're trying to find out from the Q, is um, L over 3. And there you have it. Lovely. I should point out there was a mistake in the marking schedule for this. Not a mistake, a typo. A typo will be generous um, because they arrived at the correct answer in the end. They had uh, L squared in their quadratic bit and, and they didn't have an R, but it's not that. It's 2LR. Um, there you go.